It is Wednesday evening, January 11th, 2023, and we're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're in Genesis chapter 32 tonight, so if you want to follow along in a Bible of your own, that would be great. Genesis chapter 32 will be there in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you decided to join us tonight. We want to also invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a time of Bible study. We're working our way through the book of Ephesians. And then come again at 10.30. Make sure to stick around for worship at 10.30. We'll be there for about an hour. We're getting ready to study the rest of Hebrews chapter 1. And if you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, any Bible concerns, any prayer concerns, something we need to be praying about, something we can help you with, I'd invite you to give me a call or send me a text to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you in that way. You can also send an email message to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And if you have not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, this would be a great time to do that. We want to invite you to do that, and that'll help you to stay involved and keep up with anything that's released here in the future. I don't know if any of you noticed this, but just a little bit of an update on YouTube and the videos that are posted there three times a week. Uh... You might have noticed a little bit of a difference in the um, the thumbnail for tonight's class. The thumbnails, that little image that you see, almost like a preview of what's coming in class tonight. And a week or two ago, I don't know if you know how YouTube does this. I know some of you do, but they'll take kind of a random screenshot and use that as a, a little thumbnail to announce what's coming. And they usually give you a few choices. And they're, usually there's one that's decent, sometimes... Uh, <laughs> It's a little harder to choose than others, but a week or so ago, I think when we were studying Genesis 31, it said classes about Genesis 31, and the thumbnail was actually a screenshot of a review slide from Genesis 30, and so it looked like somebody got it wrong uh, when it really wasn't wrong, and so I started thinking about that. I talked to a couple of Silas's that I know and got some input about that, so we've put together some different thumbnails for tonight's class and last Wednesday's class, and then also I'm trying one for this past Sunday's uh, sermon for the worship assembly. So if you're on our YouTube channel, you may want to poke around just a little bit and notice the difference in the thumbnails from uh, the past week or so as compared to the way it was before that. So a little bit of progress there. We're still learning a whole lot to learn with this, but that may help us to uh, see what's on there in a little bit of a better way. But tonight we're back to the book of Genesis, so the book of beginnings that that was written primarily by Moses, and we're now looking at the life of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three big patriarchs, were on Jacob. Jacob has pretty much tricked his brother by taking the birthright. He fled from his brother's wrath by heading over to Haran, where he picks up several wives, and where he's prospered tremendously working for his father-in-law, Laban. Well, in tonight's class, in Genesis chapter 32, Jacob gets a little bit closer to coming home after 20 years now. Only now he has two wives and he has two servants. I almost think of it as four wives. Sometimes I may say four wives, but they're basically treated as wives. But four wives, a total of 12 children at this point, 11 boys and one girl. And by way of very brief review, just bringing us up to speed on the chart again, Leah starts out with the first four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And this, of course, makes Rachel feel really left out over there on the right. She's the favorite wife. But she's falling behind. She is barren. She cannot have children. And so she has Jacob go into her uh, maid Bilhah, who then bears Dan and Naphtali. That makes Leah worried about falling behind. So she has Jacob go into her maid Zilpah, who bears Gad and Asher. Leah then takes the lead again with Issachar, Zebulun, and the one daughter of the family, Dinah. We'll get back to her in a week or two. This tragic, terrible thing happens to her. But toward the end of Genesis 30, we have Rachel bearing Joseph, her very firstborn. And that brings us to 11 sons and one daughter in this family of one husband and basically four wives. I've left Benjamin grayed out again as son number 12. Um, he hasn't been born yet, but we need to know about him. He is on the way. We are heading in that direction. By the way, in my handwritten notes from the last time I taught through the book of Genesis, I found a little note at the top of the page, right at the top of my notes for Genesis 32. And the note in my handwriting at the top of that page says, First service at 302 Acewood. First service at 302 Acewood. So apparently I taught Genesis chapters 1 through 31 in Bill and Jane's living room. <laughs> And we purchased our facility on Acewood on October 1st, 2001. I believe that was the date of the closing. 
And then we met on Eastwood for the very first time on Wednesday evening, October 3rd, 2001. So just over 21 years ago. And I found that note at the top of my uh, page of notes for Genesis chapter 32. So just wanted to give you a little bit of a historical update uh, tied to tonight's class. And do you remember what was happening back in October 2001? We were just a few weeks past the terrorist attacks of September 11th, weren't we? We had found our facility for sale. We put an offer on it on the weekend before 9-11, over Labor Day weekend. And we went out of town to visit my brother-in-law and his family over in Niagara Falls, New York. And we were actually on our way back home to Wisconsin from New York on September 11th. And uh, what a strange journey that was. And uh, I think we pulled over at a rest area somewhere, maybe in Pennsylvania along the interstate. It was so weird. The fire alarm blaring, uh, people just walking around dazed and confused, wondering uh, how they were going to get home and so on. But anyway, I'm just saying that the last time we studied through the entire book of Genesis on a verse-by-verse -verse basis as a congregation was back in the fall and winter of 2001. But tonight we're in Genesis 32. I do need to warn you that we are heading for something of a cliffhanger tonight. Uh, we're going to have some tension building up throughout the chapter tonight, and we will not have any resolution to it. So I hate to tell you that, but uh, just prepare to be disappointed that we don't come to the end of this story in one night. And just prepare to hang on at the end of tonight's lesson. So let's start tonight by looking together at the first paragraph. This is Genesis 32, verses 1 through 5. Genesis 32, verses 1 through 5. Now as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him. Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named that place Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. Let's remember that Jacob has left Haran after 20 years of being on the run from his brother. And partway back, his father-in-law catches up with him. He's upset that not only did he leave, but he took his daughters, his flocks, his grandchildren with him. And he also stole the family idols on the way out the door, if you remember that from our study last week. So leading up to tonight's chapter, we know Rachel is the one who took the idols. She gets away with it. Laban and Jacob then make this treaty not to attack each other. Jacob gets back to his journey. And obviously, if we can imagine this, Jacob has a lot on his mind right now. And I feel like I sometimes miss this, but in verse 1, we're told that the angels of God met him. And I know I've read this verse many times in my life, but I just don't remember this, at least in my mind. We aren't told what these angels do or what they say. All we know that is that angels are messengers, they're servants of God of some kind. And so we might assume they bring some kind of encouragement, uh, maybe a message from God. This is what you need to do next. I'm not exactly sure, but, but Jacob concludes that this is God's camp. So God is here, similar to the way that he met God in Bethel on his way up to Haran 20 years earlier. And there's a chance that the angels suggest what Jacob does next, because right at this point, he really focuses now on meeting his brother. And starting in verse 3, he develops this plan. He sends messengers on ahead to meet his brother. If you remember, Jacob is terrified of what his brother Esau might do. Uh, the last time he was in the area, Esau had threatened to kill him for deceiving their father, taking the birthright. Uh, so now Jacob sends messengers on ahead to try to soften his brother before his arrival. And he has these messengers explain where he's been. Uh, he's been with Laban, their relative. He's managed to accumulate oxen and donkeys and flocks and camels and servants. And let's also notice in verse 5 how Jacob refers to Esau as Lord and refers to himself as Esau's servant. So this is Lord, not Lord as in God, but Lord as in Master. So this is a term of respect, maybe similar to how we might use the term Sir these days. So Jacob, I think, is being very, very diplomatic here, trying to win over his brother. So let's continue tonight by looking at Genesis 32, verses 6 through 8, the next paragraph. Genesis 32, verses 6 through 8. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and furthermore, he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. For he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other 
uh, then the company which is left will escape. And this is also something I feel like I've missed here before, that Esau, once the messengers arrive, leaves home and starts heading out to come meet Jacob along the way. At least when I first went into tonight's chapter, I was imagining uh, Esau at home and Jacob is getting closer and closer. But that's really not what happens. Actually, once Esau hears from Jacob's messengers, he immediately leaves his home along with 400 men. And the messengers come back and explain this to Jacob. One of the commentaries was explaining that that number, 400 men, is used at least a couple times in Scripture to describe armies. And so 400 might have been considered kind of your standard army at that time. If you needed to take care of business somewhere, if you had 400 men with you, you could probably do it. Well, if you're Jacob and you hear your angry brother is now coming after you with 400 men, uh, what are you thinking at this point? Well, in verse 7, the text tells us that Jacob is now greatly afraid and distressed. In my mind, he was already terrified and distressed, full of anxiety over coming home, but now even more so. And I know we have a way of magnifying potential threats in our own minds, don't we? We can stay up all night worrying about stuff, can't we? And if I think some terrible thing is going to happen to me, if I have time to think about it, I can imagine things even worse than, than what might possibly happen. And so now the threat seems even to be more real than it was before to this man. So if my angry, murderous brother is now uh, not only coming to meet me, but he's meeting me with 400 men, uh, there is no possible way that this will have a good outcome. So in his fear... Uh, Jacob splits, splits this huge group into two companies, and his reasoning is that if Esau comes and attacks, then maybe the other half will be able to get away. And this, in my opinion, is a best-case scenario for Jacob. Best-case scenario, only half of us die. And so this is his way of uh, dealing with this potential disaster. At least we'll, we'll send half uh, off somewhere else. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 32, verses 9 through 12. Genesis 32, verses 9 through 12. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. Well, in a great move on his part, Jacob now approaches God in prayer. Jacob is the one who opens the door of communication. It's not God chasing Jacob down as previously, but this is Jacob approaching God. Uh, several months ago, I mentioned a little section on my resume entitled Maturing Experiences and Accomplishments. Well, uh, Jacob has had a few, hasn't he? He has had some maturing experiences, and uh, this is definitely a sign of that maturity on Jacob's part, uh, going to God in prayer on his own. You know, just 20 years earlier, he seems to have been a little bit shocked that God was way up there in Bethel. Remember that? He was traveling north, and then he has this vision of the angels going up and down the ladder or the stairway to heaven. And, and as I remember that, he was almost surprised. Like, wow, God is here. He's not just way back home. He, he's everywhere. And that was an eye-opening, maturing experience for him. Uh, but now on the way home, Jacob is the one who realizes this. So he opens the lines of communication, and Jacob goes to God for help. And I love the format of the prayer, the way he words this and uh, kind of the outline or the structure to it. In my mind, it almost reminds me at least a little bit of Jesus' sample prayer in the Sermon on the Mount over in the book of Matthew, in that he starts by addressing God as the God of his father Abraham and of his father Isaac. Well, Abraham obviously is his grandfather, not his father, uh, but he's identifying himself here as a descendant of Abraham and as a descendant of Isaac. So he's almost in my mind saying, hello, God, it's me. I'm, I'm here. And then he identifies who he is. And he acknowledges that God told him to leave home and to go up there to be with his relatives. And then he reminds God that God has promised to prosper him. And then he praises God for following through on that promise. And he confesses that he is unworthy of God's love. That word loving kindness is 
sometimes translated elsewhere in Scripture as faithful love or loyal love or the mercies of God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. As we read the prophet Jeremiah singing or lamenting there in the book of Lamentations, that's the word that he uses here, God's loving kindnesses, his mercies. So Jacob sees that God has expressed his faithful love to him, and he realizes he does not deserve this. God did this because he was God, not because he was Jacob. And that's what worship is, honoring God for loving us. That's why we come together. Obviously, we can worship on our own, but we come together as a church to worship God together. There's a huge value in doing that. Well, in a summary here, Jacob reminds God that when he first left home and crossed the Jordan, he only had a staff. But now God has blessed him into becoming this huge group, two groups, in fact. And then only after praising God, Jacob now here has a request. Deliver me, I pray. Please don't let my brother kill me. And Jacob is concerned not just for himself, but for his wives and his children. And he ends by reminding God of the promise that his descendants would be numbered as the sand of the sea. And Lord, that can't happen if my brother kills me. So uh, please, please help me out here. That's pretty much a summary of the prayer. So let's continue tonight by looking at the next paragraph. This is Genesis 32, verses 11 through 22. Genesis 32, verses uh, 13 through 22. So he spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on before me and put a space between droves. He commanded the one in front, saying, When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, saying, To whom do you belong and where are you going, and to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, These belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. Then he commanded also the second and the third, and all those who followed the drove, saying, After this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him, and you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on before him while he himself spent that night in the camp. Now he arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and he sent across whatever he had. Let's notice that when Jacob prays to God asking for deliverance, Jacob uh, doesn't just sit there waiting for God to do something about this, does he? But Jacob gets busy. He assembles a gift basket for his brother, we might say. And uh, one commentary written in the mid-1980s uh, calculated the expense of this thing. If you were to assemble a gift like this for somebody, at least back in the mid-1980s, it, it would have cost around $100,000, and he did the math on it. I'm just saying it is a huge gift to give somebody. Goats and rams and camels and donkeys, milking camels. I had no idea that was a thing. Um, but he splits these animals into groups, each guided by various servants. They're instructed to meet Esau in a series of waves, these droves. Uh, flocks and herds and all that coming along in little waves. And with each group, they are to explain that this is a gift from Jacob to Esau, uh, that Jacob, he's right behind us, you know, and then there'll be another wave. Well, he's, he's coming right behind us and then another, he's right, he's coming and so on. And the hope is that this series of gifts will soften Esau's heart and Jacob comes along at the end. That's the plan. So with all of this as uh, background, this is the end of the paragraph. So everything's been sent on ahead. Jacob is left alone here for the night. And unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, Jacob and Esau will not be meeting tonight. We're going to have to save that for next week. So hang on. We'll, we'll come back for that. But instead, we're going to conclude tonight with the last paragraph, noticing what happens next. This is Genesis 32, verses 24 through 32. Genesis 32, verses 24 through 32. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. 
Then he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh on the sinew of the hip. This past Lord's Day, we studied Hebrews chapter 1, didn't we? And this right here is one of those ways that God spoke to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. This is a weird one. This is a strange account. Sometimes we talk about wrestling with our problems through the night. Well, Jacob really did wrestle, didn't he? All night long with a man all night long until daybreak. Only the man wasn't a man, was he? Uh, When the man couldn't beat Jacob in this all night wrestling match, he uh, cheated And I don't mean that he cheated in some kind of immoral way, didn't do that. But the wrestler used a move that uh, I don't think Jacob really had access to. He touched his hip socket in a way that dislocated it. And uh, even then, I find it amazing Jacob still held on. He had a dislocated hip and he was still not letting go. And the man has to beg to be let go, which is kind of funny when you think about it. Uh, But Jacob wouldn't let the guy go until he gave him a blessing. And that's interesting. Uh, Jacob has a history of uh, kind of wrestling blessings out of people. But they have this interaction. The wrestler gives Jacob a new name, Israel, meaning the one who strives with God or God strives, indicating that Jacob had been wrestling with God or at least with some form of God or one of God's messengers. We we don't have absolute clarity on this, but it's definitely somebody sent by God uh, to wrestle. So uh, Jacob wants to know the man's name. He refuses. And blesses him instead, Jacob then renames the place Peniel, meaning the face of God, because he believed that he had seen the face of God and had lived to tell about it. Now, again, I wouldn't necessarily say Jacob saw God face to face. Elsewhere, we have a statement indicating that no one can see the face of God and live. Uh, But it certainly does seem that Jacob did see some form of God or at least a messenger of God. But what a strange account. And thinking over this, I would love... To know why this happens, what is going on here, what was God thinking, Uh, what is the purpose of this, what is the practical application of of any of this, but we're not given a reason for it. Uh, We might speculate that God was uh, testing Jacob. Uh, We might speculate that God was strengthening Jacob, maybe teaching him some kind of a lesson, you know, you should worry more about God than you should worry about your brother, something like that, I don't know. Uh, Ultimately, this is a great unknown. We are not given the reason for it. Uh, We do know that God changes his name. And I find it interesting that this being, the man, the wrestler, however we want to address him, uh, demands that Jacob tell his name. And you think about Jacob's name, it means supplanter, one who takes the place of another, going back to that deception. So he's almost forcing him to admit who he is. He is a deceiver. He is somebody who takes the place of others. And then this name is changed, which is an interesting kind of switch that happens here. For the significance of this, maybe think about the significance of other name changes in the Bible. We think about the switch from Abram to Abraham or the change from Simon to Peter and so on. There are others in scripture. Often a name change came at a critical point in someone's life. You were a fisher of fish, now you will be a fisher of men, and so on. That kind of huge change in a person's life. And I think that's what we see here. Previous to this, Jacob was something of a a schemer, a trickster, a deceiver. But now Jacob has matured. Now Jacob has learned something about God. And Jacob is in the process of transitioning to something of a patriarch, a spiritual leader, not just in his family, but really of an entire nation. Well, there's more to come. Jacob still has much to learn, but he is a changed man compared to the man he used to be when he left the promised land 20 years earlier. 
And I would just emphasize that we've been given a new name also, haven't we? Those of us who have obeyed the gospel, we have taken on the name of Jesus. We are baptized into his name. We are now known as Christians. We are now known as disciples or followers of Christ. And so that name change is indeed significant. At the end of the chapter, we now have Jacob known as Israel, limping on toward his brother. And we have this strange reference about the sons of Israel no longer eating from the hip socket out of respect for what happens here. And that's strange, isn't it? I don't think we have a reference to this uh, in the rest of the Law of Moses in terms of thou shalt not eat from the hip socket, nothing like that. Uh, but the sons of Israel were, I think we would say, pretty superstitious at times. So God never demanded this, uh, but this is one of their man-made traditions going back many, many years. And I think we see how this got started. Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis 32 with Jacob now ready to meet his brother. And we're not quite there yet, but now we're right there on the edge of it. So next week, we hope to come back together to look at chapter 33 as Jacob finally meets Esau. So I said we'd have a cliffhanger tonight. This is it. Uh, no real resolution to the meeting between Jacob and Esau, but the whole chapter certainly has brought Jacob closer to meeting his brother and has also brought his brother closer to meeting Jacob as they get ready to meet here in the middle. But uh, that, that meeting won't be happening until the next chapter, I'm afraid. And with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930 for class. We're about halfway through Ephesians. And then right after class, come together at worship at 1030 for the worship assembly. And we will hope to finish up the rest of Hebrews chapter 1. Well, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being our God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are a God who sees our struggles. And sometimes we realize that you may, in some circumstances, even cause our struggles in an effort to teach us. And so we pray, Father, that we would be faithful in all things, and we pray that we would be able to learn from everything that happens to us. We know you are a God who is concerned about us. You are concerned about our relationships. You're concerned about our families. You see the stress and strain that comes from broken family ties. And we know, Father, that you understand what we're experiencing. Father, we therefore ask for wisdom and peace as we do the best that we can to heal what has been broken. Tonight, Father, we're thankful for the new name that we've been given as your people, the name of your Son, and we pray that we would represent him well for the rest of the time that you may allow us to live here on this earth. Our Father in heaven, we love you so much. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you in his name. Amen.